we'll have some more people joining us. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, my education and outreach coordinator for the Women's Fund. For those of you who are not familiar with the Women's Fund, we are a nonprofit in Houston dedicated to providing women and girls with the tools that they need to be, be advocates for their health. And we do this through focused seminars like today's presentation, curriculum-based classes, and publications. All of our publications are completely free. I've included a link and a QR code on this slide. If you visit our website, you can download um, PDF versions of our publications, or you can also put in a publication request form if you would like physical copies. So I do encourage you to go check out our website and check out our publications. So today we are very fortunate to um, kick off the second presentation of our domestic violence awareness series um, with a presentation over supporting survivors in the wake of COVID. And so we have a um, speaker here, Chow Wen, who is the Chief Public Strategy Officer for the Houston Area Women's Center. Um, so a little bit about Ms. Wen. Um, she is tasked with managing and expanding key partnerships while positioning Hawk as thought leaders in order to drive broad awareness of domestic violence and sexual assault with a goal of reducing interpersonal violence and changing culture, culture norms about how survivors are understood. Prior to her leadership in the nonprofit space, Chow spent 15 years as a television news journalist and last served as an anchor and reporter with KHOU TV. She is the first Vietnamese American journalist to receive an Emmy Award for her documentary series covering a medical mission in Vietnam and the Houston Press has named her Reporter of the Year. Raised a Houstonian, whose family escaped from Vietnam and immigrated to the US, Chow is passionate about staying connected to her community, serving on numerous boards. She currently sits on the boards of Catapult and the University of Houston Friends of Women's Studies and is on the advisory board of Houston Achievement Place. She is also an American Leadership Class 47 Senior Fellow and was named a Top 30 Influential Woman in Houston. She holds a Master's of Arts in Social Work from the University of Houston and a Bachelor of Arts in Communication from the University of St. Thomas. Chow is frequently asked to MC events, including Houston Mayor Turner's, Sylvester Turner's inauguration in 2016. She's a proud mother of two young girls, Ryan and Miles, a Yorkie named Peanut, and she is an active member of Unity of Houston. So we are so very um, grateful to have her here. Um, giving this wonderful presentation. Before I turn the floor over to her, I do want to go over some ground rules. If you could please keep your mic on mute throughout the presentation, just so we can limit any interruptions. And if you have any questions, feel free to add those into the chat. We have allotted time for Q and A. Um, with that being said, um, we are so looking forward to this wonderful presentation. Hi, Kayla. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Kayla, so much. I really appreciate this opportunity to um, talk about the services we provide and how we've been provided them in the wake of COVID. Because as, as all of us know, our new normals have, have, have changed drastically. And the same goes for how survivors right now are protected and supported. Um, I did have a... Um, a I'm going to share my screen. Do you guys see that? No. No? Not yet. Let me see if I can share. I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, this is what I don't know how to do. <laughs> can you see my screen by any chance? No, we cannot see your screen yet. I'm wondering, Kayla, if you should share your screen. If you have a copy of my PowerPoint, I can just kind of run through it and cue you. Would that work? Doing. Yes, that. It works. Might be 
give me just okay i apologize no, um, okay yeah okay. while you do it i'll just show you a little bit about the organization the houston area women's center was founded in 1977 really at the onset of the women's movement at the time um, our original um, president and CEO, a woman by the name of Nikki Van Hightower, was working as sort of the women's liaison for the mayor's office. And soon she started receiving calls from women who were um, experiencing domestic violence. And, and back then there were no support services and shelters, um, you know, uh, uh, churches, people would kind of come up. And so soon she recognized there was a need and gathered sort of a, a group of women as advocates. And they, they soon founded the Houston Area Women's Center with just a couple of phone lines. They would literally just take phone calls in a room and try to um, shelter battered women in homes. And so that's kind of the, the, the form of the Houston Area Women's Center. Now, 42 years later, 43 years later, you know, we have a myriad of support services, including crisis response that includes 24-7 hotlines, um, our shelter, our counseling um, uh, uh, and, and advocacy um, su support programs, um, hospital accompaniment. Um, we also empower s survivors through our housing program. Um, we have a children's services in which we advocate for children who are navigating the children, the, the court system. And then we... we we also work in violence prevention, so preventing the violence before it happens through education, outreach, through our schools, through training professionals, etc. So, so the PowerPoint you see here is for anyone who might be a bystander, a friend, or survivor. And, and what I'm going to go through is sort of our basic, like, how do you support survivors? Because COVID-19 presents a lot of issues. So we'll just kind of start with the first um, slide. If you can go, Kayla, to the second slide. Uh, this has been a, a really interesting time, and, and we wanted to first thank our first responders. We consider our staff as also first responders because they are on the front lines of supporting people in the wake of COVID. Uh, next slide. I told you a little bit about who we are. We support um, those who are enduring domestic and sexual violence. Uh, we are inclusive. Uh, we support all in building safe and healthy lives, and that's through the myriad and breadth of services we provide. Everything is always free and confidential and available to everyone. And this kind of gives you uh, a rundown of all the things we provide. I think a lot of people in the community know us for our 24-7 hotlines um, and then shelter, but we do a lot more because what we've learned over the years is uh, a woman's need and family's needs are comprehensive, and it really is on a case-by-case -case basis. Maybe you don't need shelter, but you need emotional support. So uh, some of the services that we've transitioned into virtually include that safety planning. When a survivor calls, what does he or she need to know in order to stay safe? We can do that through the hotlines. Uh, counseling intakes are now doing, done virtually through Zoom calls. We're always, all, also starting support groups through Zoom calls. Hospital company, if you've been abused or raped and you find yourself at the hospital, that could be a very difficult uh, process for a survivor. So we advocate and offer support uh, and counseling services on site. Right now we're, being, we're doing that through telephone. Our housing program is still uh, meeting the needs of survivors to ensure that they have safe housing and affordable housing. We do do legal advocacy, helping sur with survivors obtain protective orders. Um, you might know that, you know, when, when the onset of COVID happened, um, protective orders were on delay, and so that was a real concern, and the courts were backed up. And case management is really helping them access resources in our community, getting a gold card, et cetera. Our essential services, those are the workers on the front line I just mentioned, is our shelter. And our Safe Harbor Hotel program offers survivors right now, if there is no shelter, because shelters around the city or having to deconcentrate, then we can provide them a hotel. So we're doing that program in sort of an unprecedented way, really housing up to 25 families a month. Usually we house three to four a month. So we've quadrupled, you know, exponentially raised that to ensure that survivors are safe and that we, we absolutely believe that we're saving lives in that process because of the added pressures and stress. Next slide. 
So what is domestic violence? A lot of people assume domestic violence is what we see, right? The physical violence, but it, it really is inclusive of all those things you see. Threats, intimidation, coercion, force, and at the root of it is to gain power and control over your spouse, your partner. So emotional abuse might look like, uh, you know, saying terrible things. Physical is the stuff that we know to be domestic violence, and we assume. Sexual abuse, um, psychological abuse, gaslighting you might have heard. And economic abuse really seems to be a very, very big factor, taking away, you know, being the breadwinner, taking away um, someone's credit card and the ability to, to financially make it on your own. Next slide. It's just some examples of what abuse looks like. I won't give you a penny if you don't do what I say. That's financial abuse. You're ugly and stupid. No one will believe you. It's threats, intimidation. If you don't do what I say, I will hurt you and the kids. More threats, more emotional abuse. And what we know about who experiences domestic violence is that it really could happen to anyone. Genders, sexualities, no matter the ethnicity, the culture, the socioeconomics, the race. You know, people think there's a certain face to a domestic violence survivor or a victim. There really isn't. And we say that this, this impacts entire communities from our kids who might be bystanders to the, to the threats of hurting pets. To those who are watching, uh, we know that it's also the leading cause of injury uh, and death. It impacts our healthcare system. It impacts the workplace. It, it causes loss of wages, loss of jobs. It really becomes a community-wide problem. It, it, what we often say is domestic violence is not personal and private. It is a public health crisis. So we look at that um, domestic violence from that model. And this is what we saw during domestic violence, and you might have seen a lot of that in the news, right? Quarantine means abusers are now trapping their survivors. It's like the ultimate tool that they use. Well, you're home now. You know, you've got nowhere to go. And that really increases the stress and vulnerability of survivors. Um, we've got risk factors that you're seeing and we're witnessing right now, you know, that the economic pressures are triggering escalating violence. Uh, because the courts were closed, abusers weren't uh, facing the accountability that they normally would face. And then we were looking at the escalation of violence. We know that after Hurricane Harvey, you know, domestic violence murders spiked by 45% in our community. We don't want to see that happen. We have heard of uh, escalating family violence calls. On our hotlines, our advocates are hearing about escalating physical violence. So it, it is a real concern right now. And these are some examples of abusers using the coronavirus to escalate threatening to throw his wife out if she is coughing, strangled by a partner because they fear going to the hospital because of threat, so they don't go. Uh, we know that strangulation is a big predictor for uh, homicide. If you've been strangled, you know, your likelihood of being murdered is very high. Um, you know, hiding cleaning supplies, hand sanitizers. So coronavirus um, offered sort of a new tool for abusers to threaten their victims, um, you know, and, and kicking them out, keeping her home against her will, uh, using the pandemic as an excuse for leaving. What are you going to do? Where are you going to go? We've heard these real accounts as well. We do know that leaving is the most dangerous time. Uh, I was just on the phone with the hospital uh, administration today, and one of their staff died in a murder-suicide, and as shocking and as awful as it is, we hear this often. Often leaving is the most dangerous time because there's not a plan in place. Um, we share with survivors that if there's a gun in the house, you're five times more likely to die. You have a 500% chance, if you're living with abuser, to die at the hands of, at the, you know, at the hands of a handgun, right? So those are the kinds of things that we offer, safety planning, 
know where the gun's stored, have an exit plan, have a code word for a family member or your children, pack a bag, take your essentials, have your cell phone ready. Because if you leave, you are likely to get hurt. And, and we use this tool often, and I think it's a really simple yet profound way of supporting survivors. Uh, we call it the three R's, and it's really simple. If somebody is sharing their story of abuse or survival, you know, listen with empathy and concern with responses like, you don't deserve to be treated with, recognize that and, and listen. And recognize the signs that they're, they're being abused. Don't listen and respond with judgment. Accept them where they are. I believe you. What can I do to support this? And then finally, refer, because we are not always the experts in their intimate partner relationships. You know, when you say to a survivor, just leave, it doesn't come across as empathetic. It comes across as judgmental. And it often further alienates a survivor because she doesn't feel supported. So refer them. Tell them help is available. Call 911, call the hotlines, that I am concerned and that there is help because oftentimes survivors don't know that there's help. So it's recognize the signs of abuse, listen. You know, I'm being abused, this is what happened, just listen to them. Um, I'm sorry. Um, respond, do not tell them I believe you. What can I do to support you? Really listen with that em empathetic ear and refer them to. Um, community-based organizations like the Houston chat line on our, our website, you know, hawk.org. Next. And some of the things I talked about, these are things that are offering support versus not offering support. Listen, valid, I hear you. I, you don't deserve this. Respect their privacy. And then offer those resource options. We're not the experts, but the advocates on the hotlines are. Don't give advice. Don't say, why don't you just go? Don't judge them. How could you stay in this relationship? It further alienates a survivor. Don't tell them to just work it out because it's really complicated. Nobody deserves abuse. And don't question their story. Well, what about this? Those are not supportive um, opportunities for you to help a survivor um, decide whether or not here in the tools, tell them that help, help is available. And then finally, we talked about this, our hotlines. Um, it's 24-7. They can also go on our website at hawc.org. There's a text chat option, a chat box that they can go through if they don't want to call. Uh, we implemented that pretty quickly at the onset of COVID. It was kind of part of our sort of overall, <laughs> as many agencies, like our long-term technology plans, but that kind of changed. Next. Kayla, next. This was the final slide. Oh, okay. I thought there was a question. So that's uh, that. In a nutshell, is and this this um, this PowerPoint or PDF is, is available for you. Um, I get calls weekly asking um, about how they can. You know, I have a friend, or I, I I always send them to the hotlines because the hotlines is the gateway to access resources. Whether it just be talking to somebody, needing a place to stay. Um, going and getting a safety plan. You know, we have this whole um, safety planning um, process that we can put a survivor through um, if they aren't sure what they're navigating so that we can save lives because oftentimes survivors don't know how grave a danger they are or they don't think their abuser is going to hurt them. So if you have questions, comments, I'm happy to take some. But um, again, this PDF is available for you. If you or someone else you know is suffering abuse, just have them call us. We're always available. Okay, great. So if you have any questions, feel free to add those into the chat and I will go ahead and ask them for you. Um, so the first question is, um, okay. can you go into a little more detail about how the work at Hawk looks differently since COVID? Um, you know, since COVID hit. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone's work, I think, uh, across 
communities, right? And particularly at nonprofits of change. Um, in terms of the program staff, those who support the survivors, everybody has gone uh, but for the shelter and the advocates who are, are um, helping with the Safe Harbor Hotel program, everybody's gone virtual. So I, by and large, work from the house. Hello? Oh, yes. sorry. I, by and large, work from the house. Um, our leadership team works from the house. Uh, our volunteer program is is kind of on hold. You know, we do accept things on Amazon wish list. Our WA location, our non-residential counseling and education campus, is um, uh, not open to the public. We do take, you know, mail. We take packages. We accept some of uh, uh, donations. So that's changed pretty drastically. Uh, what it's done for us, you know, we kind of looked at a long-term strategic plan to work sort of mobily in community communities, targeting communities that are affected by violence more, um, but it's kind of thrust that into action pretty quickly. So ultimately, our hope is, is to work in certain communities in this, in, in, this, in this city that we can actually bring the services to survivors instead of survivors come to us. Um, yeah, we're, we're like everybody else, we're on hold, uh, but we'll keep doing the work virtually and through Zoom calls and uh, um, you know, to ensure sort of keeping everyone safe. Um, the shelter, we, we implement all those protocols, as you guys know, health protocols. We had an outbreak in July. It was challenging because we had to move. We basically moved non-COVID positive clients out of the shelter into hotels because hotels are going to take COVID positive. And, and then our shelter, Alter became a COVID positive quarantine. So that was very challenging. We also had some staff who went, came down with COVID. Thankfully, nobody um, was, was seriously ill, but it definitely posed a challenge for us. And it's been uh, remarkable to see the staff continue to work there in support of the, the children and the families. Wow. Uh, yes, moving to a virtual platform has been challenging for many, but I was definitely curious to see, um, you know, what you were still able to do and how you were still able to help. So it, that's a great uh, plan to try to bring the resources to um, those who need them um, instead of having people come to the resources. So the next question is, um, regarding yeah. your hotline um i know that you mentioned that there was an increase um how how has your hotline um i guess has it been utilized a lot more during these times than usually yeah i just looked at some stats we are averaging we are seeing an uptick in hotline calls month to month and we kind of started tracking the hotline calls from March, mid-March, when sort of the city shut down till now, right? So in mid-March, I think what happened initially was there's a quieting of our hotline calls. And then you gradually saw the surge in calls in April, right, in the height of the pandemic. Some days we average about 60 to 80 calls, then we started average like 100, 110. Now we're averaging 120, 130, some days 150. So we have a about 4,000 more calls during this, 4,500 more calls during this time period, that, that March to, to uh, September time period than we did from the year past. So people are certainly calling, and it's in correlation to what we're seeing, the stressors of the pandemic, the economic pressures. It's definitely triggering what we knew to consider that domestic violence is already underreported. It's a really, it is, it is very concerning for us. Uh, we launched a citywide campaign on April 22nd with the mayor's office and other domestic violence partners called No COVID Abuse. And it's still, that website is still uh, live. It's a live sort of resource website, nocovidabuse.org, where survivors or friends could get access to the PowerPoint that I just presented to flyers, let's say you're in a business. I just talked to a business this morning. They're like, how can we pass out flyers? I said, well, just go to this website, print it out. It's not just our branding, it's all of the agencies. We also have a resource list. So if you're living in Katy or Montgomery County, you know, and you wanna call, there are other organizations doing this work as well. 
So that's been a very useful, it'll just be a live, living, evolving website for our community to um, access uh, and to obtain resources. Thank you for sharing that. I will make sure that I note that um, website in the follow-up email for those who are on today with us. Um, a follow-up question, um, and I guess this could potentially uh, tie into the hotline, but what kind of volunteer opportunities are typically available at Hawk? You know, we have great volunteer opportunities pre-COVID. We have childcare. You can train to be a hotline advocate. Uh, you can join the young leaders, which you can still join if you're a young professional. You don't necessarily have to be young, but we have a, a thriving young leaders group. And then we have um, volunteer opportunities. We have a backpack drive in the summer and a holiday gift express in the winter in which we help the clients, you know, get toys for their children, those kinds of things, backpacks for the children. So our volunteer base um, typically is very active with more than a thousand volunteers right now because we're not doing in-person and sort of face-to-face -face and, you know, hands-on work. We've asked our volunteers to just hang tight, stay connected to us via social media, via the young leaders. We are hosting an, a candlelight vigil, so we are doing social distancing slowly outside sort of activities. Um, we, we are hosting a candlelight vigil at the steps of City Hall on Tuesday, October 27th. This, this, I should have mentioned this early on. I feel like I buried the lead. This is actually Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I think you did say that, Kayla. So, so we have a host of things going on this month. Part of that is this initiative to work with you guys to share you know, what people can do to support survivors in the wake of COVID. Um, so really, you know, stay tuned, check in with us, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, ha uh, Instagram, um, and stay connected because, um, you know, we are going to go back to, to some, we're going to go back to a semblance of normality in this world. It will happen. We have to be patient, but in the, in the meantime, we can stay engaged virtually. Thank you so much. Um, the next question that I have is... In your presentation, you mentioned that domestic violence really does impact the community. It's not just um, the household, but it is the community that is also impacted. So what can the community do? Um, I guess pre-COVID, what could they do? Uh, you know, I know you mentioned volunteer opportunities, but even now um, in the midst of everything that's going on, are there things that communi community members can be doing to help? Well, that's a wonderful question. I, you know, it, it goes back to that PowerPoint I talked about, like this is a community-wide program. I think offering support to survivors, just understanding uh, the dynamics of, of domestic violence, not blaming survivors and victims, um, engaging in community-based organizations like yours and ours, and um, being interested in the mission and the movement, because this is everyone's job to to end violence. It's, you know, we're just one community-based organization in a city of nearly, in a, in a region of nearly 8 million. I mean, and we have 120 beds. So stay connected, stay involved through volunteer, through, you know, joining clubs, through uh, engaging, it, through advocacy efforts like these um, is very important. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And the next question is, um, does the center help with creating a plan for survivors to leave? And if so, can you kind of um, expand on what that looks like? So what we say is, you know, it's really up to the survivor to decide to leave because nobody is their best agency but themselves, right? But what we can provide are the tools that you need to consider to educate them about the power and control dynamics of a relationship, and most importantly, about that safety planning. So let's say I call the hotline and I'm pondering leaving. An advocate on the other side of the hotline said, well, let me help you with that safety plan. And the safety plan is basically an assessment so that you can, as you can be your own uh, advocate, right? Nobody knows my life but me and decides it to say, you know, have you considered this? Have you considered that? That safety planning will empower you to say, oh, when it's time to leave, these are the things I'm equipped with. Um, the other thing, the other tool we use is something called a danger assessment tool. How critical, how much danger are you in 
in that relationship. So the myriad of questions could be, you know, is there a gun in the house? Has he strangled you? Then your assessment for lethality, the idea that you might die, goes way up if you've been strangled, if there's a gun in the house. Um, that's a lethality assessment. We determine that. And then we also help them determine what a safety plan looks like. How do you plan your safety if you decide to leave? And then you get to make the decision when you leave, right? I don't get to make that decision, but I'm going to give you all the tools to educate you on power and control, what the, the power and control wheel looks like, you know, that, that cycle of abuse we talked about and all the forms of abuse, physical abuse, social, emotional, financial. It's amazing when you talk to survivors, Sometimes they, they, they get that educational or awareness opportunity. They go, well, that's happening to me, but it didn't occur because they're so in the violence or so in the abuse that they don't recognize that they're being abused until, you know, they get that opportunity to, to have that sort of a, that aha moment. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, kind of going off of that, the safety plan, um, so does the center offer any services uh, for survivors who have left? Um, so after they leave an abusive relationship, do you offer any services for them or for their children? Yes. And so I think that's why, you know, Hawk has sort of this breadth of services. Many people don't realize, you know, that that that, that continuum towards a path of, of self that's towards you know, self-determination and independence involves housing, involves case management, involves resource referral. So all those things involves career counseling. We offer that not only at our shelter, but let's say you're living somewhere else. We offer support services like counseling, um, housing opportunities. You know, we'll get you connected with the right housing programs if you need it. We have career counselor that can help you get back on your feet. Um, we've got, you know, children's court services that help children navigate um, the difficult task of, of going through the, the criminal court process. And we also collaborate with partners like the Women's Fund and so many other agencies, uh, the Children's Assessment Center, to ensure that women, children, and families, you know, be able to gain that self-determination and independence to live that life free of violence. So yes, a myriad of services. Awesome. That sounds really, really great. Um, so I guess my next question is, do you ever have people contact the center because they are worried about um, a loved one? All the time. People call all the time. I don't know what to do. And okay, so I, going off of that, I was curious. Um, I know a lot of times that people on the outskirts of a relationship can see that there are problems even when the people in the relationship don't necessarily see them. And mm -hmm. um, I would just be curious to know, how can you start a conversation with someone um, around domestic abuse without you know, being off offending them or, or upsetting them? It goes back to that three R's. It's, it's responding by listening empathetically, saying things like, wow, you, just being supportive, right? You really didn't deserve this. I'm really sorry you're going through this. Just listening without judgment, not saying things like, well, why don't you just leave him? Because it's easy for us, right, to say, what a jerk or what it is. Um, and then really coming from a place of empathy and saying, you know what? I believe you and I know that there's, there are people here to help and offering them resources like the Houston Area Women's Center, you know, the other agencies that are listed on the nocovidabuse.org website. Um, and, and, and I think that website's really, it's, just, it, it's for survivors and for bystanders because it offers that, you know, that, that training opportunity through the PowerPoint we just saw. And also flyers to talk about if you're trapped in a relationship, here are the things you need to do during COVID. Because, you know, you've got to have to tweak it because COVID is this unique thing where you're kind of stuck at home, whereas before the kids were going to school and now they're not. And maybe they're, there's so many added stressors. Right. Okay. So does anyone else have any questions that they would like um, to place in the chat at this time? 
I think we've learned a lot about what the Houston Area Women's Center has to offer and how their services have changed but managed to continue during the time of COVID and everything that is going on. Even though, you know, opportunities may not look the same, there are still things that you can be doing to help survivors during this time. Um, and so this was a really wonderful presentation um, over those things. So again, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and add those into the chat. If you're like me and you think about questions way after a presentation, um, if, you, if I send the follow-up email and you're going through the slides again and you realize that you do have a question that you weren't able to ask, you can always send your questions or comments to healtheducator at thewomensfund.org. Um, I will get this email and I will do my best to answer your question or reach out to whoever, whoever I need to to get an answer to your question. I also want to take this opportunity to um, ask you to please take a survey over today's presentation on SurveyMonkey. The link in the QR code are there. I will be placing this in the follow-up email as well. We are doing a raffle. So if you take the survey, you, your name will be entered into a raffle to win a $25 gift card. So um, moving forward, here are our social media pages. I encourage you to go check those out. We do post about upcoming presentations. Um, we have some fun motivational posts. We have general health posts um, as well. And then events that we have coming up, we have accountability and responsibility scheduled for tomorrow, conflict resolution on Friday, a repeat accountability and responsibility on the 19th, we have our Women's Health Lecture Series with the University of Houston on the 20th. And then we will be continuing our Domestic Violence Awareness Series on the 21st with Teen Dating Abuse Prevention. So Kelsey Siebold um, has agreed to sponsor our Awareness Series. And so we are so thankful for that. Um, it looks like I do have another question in the chat here. Um, so okay. my uh, my best friend was abused by her husband. Um, consequently, her daughter was murdered by her abuser. She feels incredible guilt. What can I do to help her? You know, tell her that, that help is available. I mean, she's suffered an unthinkable trauma. We do offer uh, individual and support group counseling services. Um, the best way to access that and line up the interview is through the hotlines. Always the gateway to accessing those resources. Um, we hear of that and I think support groups, individual counseling are, are really impactful in, in healing and, and addressing that trauma. Great. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I feel like she's probably not alone in feeling that guilt. Um, I, I would imagine that's something that survivors and then maybe not even survivors themselves but people who have been impacted because again you said it, it does impact the community but that feeling right. of guilt right okay all righty well that um it looks like we do not have any other questions at this time um chow thank you so much for joining us today we really appreciate oh, the presentation. Um, yes, the, the chat says, thank you, thank you. Um, yes, we really appreciate this presentation. You shared with us a lot of wonderful resources. This is going to be sent in a follow-up email. And so um, participants today will have access to these resources as well. And we'll be able to continue to spread the word about what the Houston Area Women's Center does and also be able to hopefully help people. Okay, well, thank you so much, Kayla, and thank you to, to all the work that you guys are doing at the Women's Fund. It's a great organization. So glad you're out there sharing information and knowledge and empowering women to protect their health. 
Yes, thank you, Chow. This is Linda Rhodes. We appreciate you so much. And if y'all want to hear more from Chow, she'll be one of our guest panelists at our education session uh, prior to the Rock and Resiliency Luncheon on November 1. Thanks, thank Linda. You. Uh, thank you. Can't say no. You can't say no. Bye. Bye. Bye.